Well, here I am, and I'm really excited because we're all the way up to chapter 10 on the youngest Templar Keeper of the Grail. And uh, it's been pretty exciting. I'm all out of breath. I'm a little bit perspiring uh, just at the excitement that this book is bringing uh, everyone who's been participating in this read-along. So what do you say we jump right in to chapter 10 of Keeper of the Grail? Remember to look at uh, Books Are Essential, hashtag Books Are Essential, hashtag Authors Take Action, and hashtag Authors Give Back, and you'll find lots of stuff like this out there being done. So here we go. <clears throat> Little John, as he was called, worked quickly as he reshot Dauntless. For a man so large, his movements were graceful and precise with little wasted motion. He had an easy way with the horse, talking softly as he moved from side to side, petting him gently on the flanks to keep him from kicking while he reattached the horseshoes. As he worked, he questioned me. Where did Sir Thomas find you, Tristan? I've been living with the monks at St. Albans Abbey, I said. I've heard of St. Albans. Were you taking bows? No, sir. I'm an orphan. I was left with the monks as a babe. Sir Thomas and his men came through two days ago. He asked me to join him as a squire. I see, said Little John. And he didn't say anything more for a while as he worked. Removing the loose shoe on Dauntless's foreleg, he took it to the forge, pumping the bellows until the coals glowed bright orange. As the shoe heated, it turned first white and then orange in the fire. Moving it to the anvil, he took a hammer from the bench and pounded on the horseshoe several times until it took a shape that pleased him. He plunged the horseshoe into the tub of water and the steam rose in the air with a hiss. In a few moments, the horseshoe was reattached. Have you known Sir Thomas for a long time, I asked. Little John stood and wiped his hands on his apron. Aye, for a while. Before Sir Thomas joined the temple, I was a smith in King Henry's army, attached to Sir Thomas's regiment. After I left the army, I came here to Dover. Whenever Sir Thomas passes through, he makes sure to bring his horses by for shoes. I also provide Sir Thomas with his swords. Come, let me show you. Little John went through the back door, and in the rear was another workbench set along the back wall of the shop. On it lay a short sword that appeared to be brand new. He held it out to me with a handle forward. Take it, he said. I took the sword in my hand, testing its weight. It was about two feet long, and the hilt was wrapped in black leather. I'd never held a sword before and was surprised at the weight and heft of it. First time holding a sword, he asked. Yes, sir, I said. Well, I think you'll soon become familiar with them. You'll need to know about swords and weapons where you're going. This is called the hilt, he said, pointing to the leather grip enclosed by my hand. Those metal pieces sticking out from above the hilt are guards. The metal knob on the end of the hilt is the pommel. I looked at the pommel and saw that there was a small illustration engraved in it. It showed two knights riding double on a single horse. That is a symbol of the Templars, Little John said. The knights of the temple take a vow of poverty, and to share a horse shows that they are willing to do without in service to God. I nodded in understanding, for I had seen the same illustration in paintings and tapestries that hung in the halls of the commandery. This is a short sword. It is used primarily for self-defense. It is made of fine steel and is very sharp but it is not meant to stand up to the weight of a battle sword or scimitar. It is for quick thrusts and jabs only, not for fancy sword play. Go ahead, give it a try. Swing it back and forth a few times. I stopped, stepped a few feet away from Little John, brandishing the sword through the air in a crossing pattern. I knew nothing of swords, but it seemed a fine weapon. Not too heavy, but it had some heft to it. It's beautiful, I said. Little John reached out and took the sword carefully in his hand. Take the grip deeper into your fist like this, he said. Make sure that your hand fits snugly under the guards for protection. Here, let me show you. So little John gave me my first brief, brief lesson in swordplay, teaching me to use the weapon correctly so that I didn't accidentally injure myself. After just a few minutes of these exercises, my arms had begun to ache, and I told little John that I must return with Dauntless to the commandery. To my surprise, he took a scabbard from the rook bench and sheathed the sword, then handed it back to me. It is yours, he said. My jaw dropped open. What? No, sir, I, I couldn't possibly accept it. Little John laughed and held out his hand for the bag of coins. <clears throat> sir Thomas had given me. Take the pouch. He put, he, taking the pouch, he put it in the pocket of his apron. There now, you already paid me. Sir Thomas always hires me to make a new sword for his squires. He ordered this one several months ago, and I've been working on it since his last squire left the order. Sir, I, I don't know what to say, I sputtered. Thank you. Th thank you very much. It's a fine weapon. I, I'm grateful for your work. It's my pleasure, Tristan, and a word of advice. Keep that sword handy. If you run into a couple of ruffians like you did earlier, don't be afraid to show it. Keep it clean and sharp. Care for it, and it will take care of you, he smiled. 
I will, sir. I promise. And thank you again. Now, if you'll forgive me, I, I must return to the commandery. Sir Thomas will be waiting. There is much work to be done before we sail. Good luck to you, Tristan. Sir Thomas is one of the finest men I've ever known. You'll do well as a squire. Listen to what he has to teach you. Trust him. Good luck to you. I hope to see you again someday. Little John waved as I stared up the street. Every few steps, I touched the hilt of the sword now hanging at my belt. In my mind, I saw myself following Sir Tim Thomas and the Templars into battle with my sword held high. Reaching the crowd of the marketplace, I noticed that the guards were still in evidence. In fact, there were now six of them, and they were definitely shadowing me. I could not fathom their interest, but something in their manner made me uneasy. I quickened my pace, but was slowed by the midday crowd in the market. It was not easy to quickly move a stallion through hordes of people. As we turned to the end of the road that led to the commandery, the crowd pressed in around us. I took a tighter grip on Dauntless's range, not wanting him to spook, but compared with the noise and confusion of battle, the marketplace seemed not to affect him at all. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed two of the guards draw closer, falling into step a few paces behind me. The crowd was noisy, and I made only halting progress. As I came past a row of vendor stalls, a man pushing a cart of vegetables crossed in front of us, and I had to pull Dauntless to a halt, waiting for the man to clear out of the way. Forced to stop, I was about to turn and face the king's guards directly behind me when over the den of the marketplace I heard a noise that left me frozen in fear. The unmistakable sound of a sword being drawn from its scabbard. And that's the end of chapter 11, and we'll be back tomorrow with chapter, I mean chapter 10, sorry. Be back tomorrow with chapter 11. We'll see you then. Everybody be safe.